So it is a few minutes before um, before eight o'clock, and we are going to get started. So I am going to get started. Okay, so it's seven fifty-five. And like always, we're going to do the drawing for the um, all the IP attendees for last month. So um, let's see. All right. So we are giving away. And now you have to remember, this goes back to last month's gathering. So um, we are giving away a Brew Now kombucha kit from Kombucha Camp. Again, this is Hannah Crum that told us all about kombucha. And um, let me share my screen so that you guys can see what. Huh. Sorry about not having music, but you know, I mean, is it really a, a national virtual gathering if there is not some sort of fluke? So your kombucha brew now kit. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Brew now kit, because I was saying it wrong every time on the last gathering. You're going to get a SCOBY. You're going to get your starter liquid, which you need um, to do your kombucha. You're going to get Hannah's special tea blend for perfect kombucha. Um, reusable muslin tea bags, sugar cane juice, um, cotton, cotton cloth to cover your vessel. And then, of course, it will ship to you for free. And then you'll get an e guide and um, all that. So, all that is going to come to our special winner from now. Remember, this is all VIP attendees from last month's gathering. All right, let me get my sticky note so I can write down. Are all ready? Drum roll, everybody. Do a drum roll. Here we go. Good luck, everybody. And our winner is... Tony Pendleton. Yay, Tony. All right, I'm writing that down, Tony, um, so that I can get with you and make sure that you get your kit. So look for an email from me, um, probably coming from the media at NLHG um, email address in the next week. And um, I just want to make sure that I'm shipping it to the right location. So um, that is why I need to email you. So just to verify that your information is correct. All right. So we got two minutes left. If you guys are in here already and there are some of you, go ahead and pop over there in the chat. Tell me where you're from. Let me know where you're representing. Woo, woo. Got South Carolina here in the house. I know we've got Georgia and Idaho represented by our speakers. Um, we've got Indiana, Jesse's from Indiana. We've got Cindy out in Montana, Georgia, Denver, Colorado, Oklahoma. Hey, Julie. Um, another Colorado, of course, Montana, North Carolina. Hey, neighbor. Um, Kansas. Another Idaho, some more Georgia, Ohio. I love it. From all over the place, you guys. I love seeing these pop through where everybody is from and seeing all the different places. Uh, we have people from all over the world that comment on our stuff online. And so um, it's just fun to see where the whole group is from. Um, you know, when we're doing our live events to see who's in the house, as they say, you know, the cool kids um, and just see who all's here. And, you know, it, even though I may not have met all of you in person, you know, I'm starting to feel like I get I'm getting to know you more as I pop in and out of the breakout rooms and, you know, just get to see your faces and put a face with a name and um, and all that. So. Anyway, keep telling, let me know where you're from as you're, as you're coming in. People are continuing to jump on. So um, if you haven't put it in there, let me know. And it is now eight o'clock. 
Woo, 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 woo. Welcome to the National Virtual Gathering, ladies. It is May. I cannot believe it has been a month already. I'm telling you, I feel like I blink and we go from one gathering to the next and it is just here again. And that is great because I love it and have so much fun with these national virtual gatherings, if you can't tell. Um, but so I'm glad you're here. We've got Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, all kinds of places um, with us today. And we are so excited to have everybody here. And we're glad that you chose to join us to learn more about um, meat, sheep, or sheep in general, if you just wanna know about sheep. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, so at the end of the gathering, we're gonna do our breakout rooms again, and those are done by region. So at the end of the gathering, we're gonna put a link in the chat and it's gonna take you to a regular Zoom meeting. Like what we're in now is considered a webinar, even though it's not really a webinar, but um, so this format is a webinar format and that's why you can only see the presenters. So the link at the end of the video will take you or at the end of the gathering will take you to a breakout room. And the breakout room link is just a, a normal Zoom meeting like you're used to. And when you get there to that meeting, you'll have a choice of different breakout rooms and it's done by region. And you can choose the breakout room that is that where your state or is located. If you have a chapter in your state, if you don't have a chapter in your state, choose the one closest to you. And that'll give you ladies in your area. And that way, if there are certain things, um, you know, if you want to talk about raising sheep in the winter, that's going to be very different in North Idaho than it is where I am in South Carolina. So it wouldn't do me very much good to listen to a conversation about North Idahoans talking about raising sheep in the winter because down here we just like toss them a little extra hey I don't know I don't raise sheep I don't know what you do to them but you know down here it's very mild like I don't even close the door to my coop for my chickens at night in the winter they're fine it just doesn't get that cold here but um anyway so you go by region Jesse Reed my wonderful wonderful sidekick she will be over there um waiting for you Yes, you. And if you don't know how to put yourself in a breakout room, all you got to do is say, hey, Jesse, can you throw me in this breakout room? And she'll pop you right over there and zoop, off you go. And you just chat with the ladies. And it's 30, 45 minutes. You just chat. And then over there, okay, so you, you'll get the registration link for the next gathering over there. So don't hang out here thinking that you need to wait for the registration link. Go on over there and they'll remind you, um, to, to get the registration link. Okay, also, got to do this really fast because we're running out of time. Um, there was some confusion about us starting a little bit early and I take complete responsibility for that and I'm sorry. So at 7.55, I do the drawing for the VIP attendees from last month's gathering. So Tony Pendleton, Tony Pendleton won the Brew Now kit from Kombucha Camp, Hannah Crumb, from last month's gathering. The reason we do that is because there's a lot of like compilation, like we have to look at the attendees report and compare it to current members. And it's just this whole, like, it takes me a little while to do it. So I can't do it on the fly, like I do um, the attendees versus the registrants and all that. So um, you are missing nothing. If you log on at eight o'clock sharp, you are going to get the entire gathering. The only thing that happens prior to 8.00 p.m. is me running my mouth and we do the drawing for the previous month's winner. So if you, if you like to watch giveaways, if you want to see that Wheel of Names spin, sign on at 7.55 and you can catch that every month. If not, if you can't get here to 8, don't worry about it. All I'm doing is running my mouth a little bit ahead of time. And you know how me, I like to talk. And that's why they have to give me a very strict schedule. And I'm one minute over. So if you have any questions on any of that, please let me know. You can throw them in the chat. I'll check them out. But you guys are not missing a single thing prior to, um, prior to 8 p.m. I just wanted to let you know um, the gathering does start at 8 o'clock. I know there was some confusion. I'm so, so sorry. Nobody missed anything except that little wheel spinning. Um, but we didn't want to take up any time 
from this month working on last month's stuff. So um, I hope that clears it up. And if you want to watch the, the giveaway, 755, if not, come on at eight. Cindy, yes. I took up your time. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll talk extra fast. Um, so first thing we want to do, because we are a national organization, we want to remember why we all gather together, because our purpose of being here is to, I wish I could hear everybody, empower women through homesteading. And how do we do that? We share knowledge. We, what's the next one? Build communities and grow friendships. So that's why we are here and how we do it. And then the next thing, and this is my favorite, and we haven't had a chance to do very much of these um, of late, and that is to um, share our Atta Girls. So Miranda has been putting this on Mighty Networks, and so I am going back and just pulling some from the list that was on there, and there was a lot. And I'm telling you, if y'all are having a down day and just feeling like, oh my gosh, I just don't know how I can do anything more or how I can do this or whatever, this is what you need to see is the Atta Girls um, on this page. Just reading through them, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. So many things are going on. So I'm just going to read a few. Uh, Shayla Taylor said she caught a 17-inch three-pound fish from her pond, and they had three dinners from it. There you go. Uh, Teresa Everest finally got my onions and peas in the ground. Woohoo! That's great. Uh, Wendy Hallgreen, she's 56 years old, go for the 50s. Um, I put in four wood fence posts by myself and stretched the fencing with very little help. Was so tired at the end, I almost cried, but I did it. And that's the important thing, you actually got it all done. Um, let me see, there's another one on here. Uh, Susie Preston washed down two thirds of the furniture in her carport with Murphy's oil soap. One of those things that we can easily forget and go, you know, I'll get back to that later, but she actually did it. Um, Holly Boyd sent in a picture of all her seed starts. Good luck getting all those in the ground, but they look beautiful um, from what I can see right there. Let me see, we'll just do a few more and then we'll be done. So be sure and share you so that I have something to talk about next time. Um, Catherine Laughlin, I'm trying something different this season, which is grow all you can eat in three square feet. Uh, let's see how that works. So good, let us, I mean, put it back on here, how that goes. Um, I used to do a lot of the square foot gardening, so I know you can get a lot out of a little bit of space. I love this one by Christina Anderson. I started a thing called the April Purge Challenge. A few others joined me. The goal was is to purge at least one item per day every day in the month of April. So you can choose any month. It doesn't have to be April. Um, she chose clothes for her purge. I hope to do this every month with a different selection. We shall see. But for now, it's been amazing. I have averaged five pieces of clothing per day purged. Motto is purge to freedom. Anyone is welcome to join. Good job. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is just to follow through with that. So anyways, that's just a few that I got to. There's more on there. So if you want to be encouraged and um, or share your um, victory that you had in your homesteading, please post on our um, post that's going to be up on Atta Girls and share your Atta Girls. So the next thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to introduce you to Amanda. She is on our executive staff and we asked her to do her, her story. Basically our, her story is how'd you get here? How'd you get into homesteading? Um, it's amazing how powerful stories can be. And so I'm going to be interviewing Amanda with a couple of questions tonight. And so, um, Amanda, if you're there, come on with me. You didn't see her face. There she is. Smile for the people. There, there we go. go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Amanda is on our executive staff, but before she was on our executive staff, she had another life. Now it's just LHG. Um, Amanda, when did you first realize that you were interested in homesteading? So I first got into homesteading when my oldest son, we realized that he had reactions to things like food dyes and preservatives and food. So, and this was like 10 years ago. And so you didn't have all of the choices in the stores that you had now. 
So my first, you know, foray into homesteading was learning how to bake bread uh, for sandwiches and two cherry tomato plants, basically, is what it was. And so seeing the difference in his diet is what actually made us continue. And then we've moved like way further on. Basically, all of our food is now from scratch, pretty much local. Um, not even just food. There was actually an experiment with making sunscreen that I will never, ever repeat. Um, <laughs> so you can't take it too far. <laughs> But that's what that's what made it start was realizing the things that we put in and on our bodies are causing a huge impact. Yeah, it's behavior. funny I, that my kids were the impetus for getting into that, too. It's amazing what we would do for our kids, but not for ourselves. Um, what did you what did it look like for you at the beginning? So the first couple of so years, in the beginning, the beginning first couple of years, we were actually in a subdivision. We actually had a huge lot compared to what we have now, but we couldn't do anything with it but have grass and flowers. And so literally we had one or two later on square foot boxes, four by fours, and we had tomatoes and that was basically it. And I was buying things from, which is how I heard about your farm, through Athens Locally Grown, which is our online farmer's market. And so that was how I kind of got introduced to some more of the people that were in it and seeing what I was doing at home. So we were doing a lot of in the house stuff like homemade cooking, baking and that kind of stuff in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I first met you, you used to bake and cook all the time. Oh, I still do. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm sure you do, but I was just amazed. I don't cook. So I just was like so impressed because you made everything, everything. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. What was the impetus to continue in this pursuit? Because it's a lot of work. So, well, it's, and, but still, it made such a difference in my kid's behavior and his learning that, you know, it's really hard to walk away from that. And two, it was, I felt much better eating this way, eating cleaner, eating, you know, whole foods, eating locally. And so, um, you know, it's really hard to walk away from that once you've had it. Yeah. So yeah, we just kind of built on it, you know, from there to add in the things that we do most. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find NLHG? So, again, I was following your farm page because we had bought some stuff from you, actually, on Athens Locally Grown. And so I had, I saw your very first post about the meeting. It wasn't called a gathering um, at your house, but it was, it was a really bad time. It was before it was in between a miscarriage and a pregnancy. And so it was a really bad time. And it wasn't until after the, my youngest was born, I guess he was about 18 months old before I actually made it to a gathering. But I had followed your page, seen all the meetings. And then when the Facebook group opened, I joined the Facebook group to follow along there. So okay. that's how I found y'all. Great. And look at you now. Um, how has NLHG uh, impacted your homestead journey? So I have discovered that I don't have to do all the things. So because I actually have this community near me now, I know who I can go to if I want to learn about something else or if I'm interested in bringing something onto my homestead, I know who to ask. Um, or if I don't want to have it at all, you know, on my homestead, but I need to get it, I know who to go to. And so it's, that it's impacted our homestead because I can focus on what I want that I, or what I need most or what I enjoy most. And I don't have to focus on all the things that make up, you know, everything that we need. Mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting. So the one word that so fits this, I remember I had to speak at a conference and they asked me to explain LHG and this was in the very, very beginning of it. And so I went home and I was, you know, I was thinking, how do I do a PowerPoint on that? And so then I looked up dependent and I thought, you know, are we dependent on one another? And I thought, nope, that's not us. And then I thought, are we independent? You know, like everybody's self-sufficient and we just get together for these gatherings once a month. And then I realized, no, we're all interdependent. Because, and it's exactly what you said, like everybody has their own little niche that they do. And then we share so that none of us have to carry the burden of all of it. Cause that's, that'll put you in the ground 
in a box, oh. you know, so yeah. it's, it's just too hard. So I, I think that's so cool that we've created this community where we can be interdependent on one another. Um, okay, how has NLHG affected your family? Um, my family now knows how to grow things. They know where their food comes from. They know that their meals don't start at the grocery store. Um, they start in the backyard or at a friend's house or you know somewhere else nearby. Um, they know what it's like. We have chickens. And so they know what it's like to have to take care of something that feeds you. They're super upset right now because we are to have like 30 set, 37 dozen eggs that we need to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have talked my husband into planting clover instead of having a lawn that we need to mow every 10 days. So basically I have brought them all over to the home setting side. <laughs> they got, they drank the Kool-Aid. Um, how has your involvement with NLHG pushed you into other pursuits? So my position uh, at NLHG right now is the communications director. And in doing that, I do a lot of the social media, the website, the newsletters, and all that kind of communication stuff for, um, for us in general. And so I have spent countless hours on the computer, you know, learning how to play the game, learning how to do the analytics, learning how to track everything. And because of that, I actually opened up a business uh, at the end of last year to do social media counseling or consulting, I don't know what you call it, um, to small businesses to help them kind of sort of navigate all the changing algorithms and things like that. And I think that's so cool. I've heard of a lot of people who've got, or a lot of women who've gotten involved with LHG and they found something that they were really passionate about and they just were, you know, thriving in their passion and then realized other people wanted a part of that, whatever it was, whether it was a service or it was a product or something. And so then these little cottage industries start up. And I, to me, that's like one of the best things that comes off of being part of LHG and, and being able to dabble in all these different things and then finding one thing that you really, really enjoy and can make a profit from. So super cool with that one. Okay, last question, you're doing great. If you had one encouraging word to give to women who have yet to get involved with NLHG, what would that be? So my word, words would be just to do it if you don't have a chapter try to start one if you do have a chapter get involved with that chapter and if you can't actually make the gatherings then show up on the mighty network our online communities and just start those relationships just just do it basically is my yeah. word yeah i and that's really good because a lot of us are fearful, you know, or there are fears and some who are introverts like you are, um, I remember dragging you in and look at you now. Um, but, uh, you know, taking that first step and it really does make a difference when you make connections with other women and that community is just unbelievable. And the thing is, you never know when you're really going to need the community, you know, maybe fun and encouraging all the time, but there may be something that comes up in your life where you go, man, I need a community. And if you have one, there's just nothing like it at all. Mm -hmm. So, well, good. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Ginger, take it away. All right, so I am going to not really do much of an introduction here and I'm gonna let the ladies introduce themselves as they go because um, we have two great speakers tonight. We're kind of doing a, not really a panel, but we've got um, Beth Warner who's in Georgia and we've got Nicole Hundrup who is in North Idaho. So we have two very different locales for our speakers. But this goes to show that you can do this anywhere in any climate. So um, I'm super excited that these ladies are here tonight. I think Beth, uh, I think I read an email from Beth that said she had like 43 lambs from 
from 20 use this this year or something crazy like that. Um, and I'm sure she'll talk more about that. And um, Nicole will, will tell you about her farm. But uh, ladies, I'm not sure who's going first, but whoever wants to pop on, I guess that's Nicole. Here's Nicole. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. We're so glad you're here and take it away. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name again is Nicole Hundrup and I'm from Hundrup Homestead. And we're all about inspiring families to become more self-reliant without breaking the bank. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about Meat Sheep on Hundrup Homestead. The very first year we had Meat Sheep, we grabbed uh, five ram lambs from a local supplier. We threw them on the field and uh, in the springtime, and then come fall, we butchered them. And it was great. They kept the pasture mowed down um, and they were pretty tasty. And each year we've sort of progressed um, in our knowledge and what we're doing now, we're breeding our own. And so I wanted to sort of tell you um, some basics that we probably, we maybe put the cart ahead of the horse and I don't know if there's anyone else who has ever done that before, but um, tell you what it'd be good to know going into it. One of the things is making sure your property is prepared. Uh, fencing is important. Now sheep are typically known for uh, not being hard on fencing. We have a four foot field fence. Um, a lot of people will use an eight strand high tensile or they'll even use electric uh, netting fencing that you can move around the pasture. Um, a big thing with fencing comes down to uh, what are you dealing with, maybe predator wise, or if you're gonna be doing rotational grazing, um, things like that. And one of the websites that we really love is uh, www.sheep101, I believe it's .com. And they have just some really great a basic information about things, say like fencing. Um, another thing you need to be mindful of is noxious weeds. We called up our local extension office and they came for free. And then they gave us a report of everything that was in our pasture, the good grasses and the bad weeds. And we always wanted to stay uh, more organic based, um, but we ended up almost losing a ram lamb a couple of years into St. John's wort, which causes photosensitivity um, and then eventually liver failure. So we had to keep them in our lambing shelter for two weeks away from the sun. And we ended up treating our field uh, because we just, we didn't want to lose uh, any animals to it. So make sure you check and make sure there's nothing out there that's going to be toxic to your sheep. Um, shelter, really this all depends on where you're from. Uh, you know, we have hoop houses, which it's important if you make those, anchor them down uh, for shade because we don't have a whole bunch of trees. And um, we have some, you know, more permanent structures, but that's for winter time and breeding. Uh, you need to check into your water source if you wanna carry five gallon buckets across the field, that's fine, that's your thing. But you know, if you're having to put up fencing, maybe uh, look where your water is gonna be coming from and uh, keep that in mind. And then also electric. Now we only use that during lambing season uh, because it's still pretty cold out and we put out uh, sweeter heaters. And we also have cameras that we put out there so we can check around the clock no matter where we're at. Um, Next is choosing a breed. And this is where sometimes we put the cart ahead of the horse again. We find the breed. Sometimes we buy the breed and then we put it on our property and then we figure out what we need to do with our property. So I highly recommend finding someone local. Uh, one of the things about getting sheep locally is they're used to the forage. They are used to the climate. If you have sheep shipped across the country, there is more of a chance that they may end up, you know, having an injury or come into contact with disease and it really stresses them out. And they may not thrive um, on the forage that you have and in the climate that you're in. Also, 
finding someone who's local means that you might get yourself an amazing mentor. And I don't know if I could say this enough, but get yourself a mentor with this because if you have any sort of anything come up, um, being able to call them or even going and learning alongside of them, um, whatever that may be, whether it be lambing season or processing, even building fences, it's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, when you're looking at a breed, there's single, dual, tri, and some people even say quad pur uh, purpose sheep. So you have your uh, meat, wool, um, milk, and for the quad, some people say horns because there's a market for that. So if you want several purposes, that's great. We went with a strictly meat sheep. Um, we've noticed, like we love our salmon favorols and they're a dual purpose heritage bird, um, but they do not lay eggs every single day in their medium sized eggs instead of large eggs. And they are a meat bird, but it takes about six months to grow them out. So um, if you get a breed that is just known for meat, you're going to have a larger carcass, you're going to have a, a mild, more delicious flavor. Um, but, you know, if you're into fiber, by all means, find yourself a fiber and meat uh, dual purpose breed. Um, so here's just a few of the well-known meat breeds, but there are over 1,000 breeds um, that have been documented. For hair sheep, there's the American black belly and the Barbados black belly. There's Dorpers, there's Katahdins in St. Croix. For wool, there's Dorset, Hampshire, Southdown, uh, Suffolk and textile and Tunis, Tunis, Tunis. I believe that's what you have best. So I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Another thing to keep in mind is pulled versus not pulled. Pulled means that they don't have horns. Uh, horns can be great handles. Our katahdins are pulled. So one downside to horns is it can get caught in fencing, especially field fencing. And sometimes it can be a little bit dangerous. We do have young children, so it's something we keep in mind. So the reason we chose Katahdin, um, they are naturally parasite resistant. They are known for their delicious mild flavor. There is less upkeep with because you they shed their hair, so you don't have to shear them. Um, and because we are not working with fiber right now, that's really important. It's one less thing we have to do or have to pay someone to do. Um, Katahdins, the average U-weight is 120 pounds to 160 pounds. The Rams is 180 to 250. Most Katahdin ewes are known to have a 200% lamb crop. Uh, a lot of ours actually have triplets instead of twins. So um, they're, uh, they're an awesome breed. Are they the breed for you? Maybe, maybe not. So we talked about purchasing. Make sure when you go to buy an animal and bring it to your property, have a spot to do a 30-day quarantine. That way you don't bring um, any nastiness to your flock that you may already have. Um, and make sure you go, if you can, to tour that farm or homestead and see the condition of the animals, see where they're kept. Um, I know it's hard, but it's okay to say no and to walk away from a sick animal. There are some diseases that will stay in your soil for a really long time and you just don't wanna, you don't wanna do that, trust me. Um, castrated or not. So some people swear that it's a more mild flavor if the animal is castrated. So if you buy uh, from a breeder, they might ask you if you want it castrated or not. Um, other people swear there's no flavor difference when you're processing an eight month old ram. So we, because we have a small flock on the homestead, um, we go by what our customers ask, but if we keep some, we tend to band them because we keep them with the ewes since we have 10 acres and it's hard, even if we put the rams on the very far back corner, um, if they smell a lady in heat, they will do their best to get through the fence. So I'm going to show you guys something. I, I'm glad you can't smell this from there, but we use something called a Johnson shield. It's very, it's yucky right now. It's my husband's job to clean it. It's, it's stiff and yucky because it was on our last ram, but this goes right underneath their arms. And so when they try and mount it, actually the apron blocks 
the, you know, it from happening. So um, we've gotten several of these and we really enjoyed them. And I actually talked with, it's a Baculus goat um, supplies, House of Baculus. They said for our um, webinar tonight that they were giving us a 10% off uh, promo code and that's 10 goat, all uppercase. So I hope you guys check them out. We really love their products. All right, I'll just try and be a minute or so more. Uh, feeding, make sure you have minerals and supplements, uh, free range, uh, free access to baking soda. You need to make sure if you get a mineral block or loose mineral that it doesn't have a whole lot of copper, maybe just a little bit, but copper uh, 15 to 20 parts per million is lethal. Um, hey, you know, this is, depends. If you're in a short growing season, uh, you might need it. If you're only getting them in spring and processing them in fall, you might need it. Um, we love Sanfoin. It's, uh, some people call it the holy hay. It's a natural wormer. It's a high protein source. Um, it has tannins, which help the uh, sheep to absorb it and it gives them rapid live weight gain. Um, it also helps, it's bloat free. Supposedly um, it's been found that as little as 20% sanfoin hay in their diet uh, can reduce the risk of bloat to zero. Um, and it also is good for, it's a great nitrogen fixer for your soil if you were to grow it. Rotational grazing is really important. If you can do it, it can help cut down on disease. Um, and it's actually healthier for your field. So that's another option. Uh, you need to keep in mind enemies, disease, and predators. We have LGDs. So that's going to depend on where you're from and what you have to deal with. Uh, you might just be fine with some proper housing, or you might need to get a couple of LGDs. Um, disease and sickness. So Laura Lawson has some great resources. This is one of my favorite books that she has. And it has actually in the back a flow chart that um, can get you through uh, some of the diseases that you might deal with. So proper nutrition should help prevent most diseases and sickness. But we like to have on hand Catron 4. Um, this is for fly strike. We like to keep a uh, nutrigen on hand um, as well as like a triple action wound treatment. And then we keep... Um, different uh, supplements, vitamins, uh, through injectable or through a paste. Okay, processing. Why do it yourself? Locally for us, it literally doubled the price per pound uh, to have a butcher do it. And so you need to check if you wanna sell your local regulations. For here, if you wanna sell meat by the pound, you need to have it done at a facility that has a USDA uh, person on staff. Um, but doing it yourself helps you become more self-reliant as well. Uh, we use obviously uh, sharp knives, bone saw, uh, gun. We use a hoist, a gambrel, butcher paper, uh, garbage can to collect um, everything that we're not keeping. Um, a sanitary work spot and a place to hang the carcass. We like to hang ours overnight and we wait to make sure it's cool enough, but not freezing. Um, Jesse's gonna post some resources for YouTube videos that we really like for breaking down sheep uh, and for skinning them. And um, let's see, I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit to be done. Um, one thing with a small flock, what do you do with older ewes or aggressive rams? Some people will use them as dog food. We love to make sausage. It's amazing. Um, I have, thank you for the link, Jesse. one of our favorite, a red wine rosemary sausage, and no one knows the difference. Um, it's one of our favorites, that one right there. You have to keep in mind for having a small flock on your homestead, the maintenance of hoof trimming and potentially shearing. Um, and I shared some of my favorite tools and resources. Um, and I think that's it. I can't wait to hear what Beth has to say. If you guys have any questions, um, my notes will be available to VIP members afterwards. And um, I will try and jump into all of the breakout rooms and answer any questions anyone has that we don't get to at this point in time. Thank you ladies so much. Thanks, Nicole. It was great. 
I wanted to remind all of our people or women who are on tonight, be sure if you have questions, put them in the Q&A that's at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, Jesse's keeping track of them. And if it's not answered during their presentations, then we will go back to that and ask them that question so you can get your questions answered during this time with our speakers. And so now, Beth, I'll pass it on to you. So good evening. Um, I'm Beth Warner in Georgia, about two hours from Atlanta, uh, about 30 minutes out of Athens, Georgia. Nicole had um, some terrific information. I absolutely agree with her on Sheep 101, on Nutrigench, on all the areas that she recommended and the resources. They are absolutely worth checking out. I'm going to share a couple of slides with you about our operation and we'll just go from there. So let's see. Right here. Showing. Make sure everyone's seeing it. Uh, can I get a confirmation? Are you seeing the slides? Yes, yes we, we are, but hit, hit your so uh -huh. slideshow button. Yeah. You see that at the top and then hit start from the beginning. How about that? Yep, that's where you want to be. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. So we raised tuna sheep um, and I know the topic tonight was meat sheep. Tunis um, is meat sheep and a wool sheep. So we're gonna talk a little bit about meat sheep and more. Our farm is Sheep Coat Farm. And as I said, we are in Georgia, not far from Athens, Georgia in the little town of Danielsville. Why Tunis? Tunis are a heritage breed sheep. So are the Katahdins that Nicole referenced. Tunis are a dual plus purpose sheep. They are bred for meat. For wool, some people use them in dairy operations. They're not as milky as, a, say, in East Frisian, but they often are used to bulk up a dairy program. Cornell University has used them a couple of times in their crossbreeds. And like any sheep, any animal, they provide other products as well. Um, heritage breed. May is International Heritage Breed Month. Heritage breeds, I think of them often as I do like heirloom vegetables. These are breeds that are very specific, often to a location. These are the breeds that you might have seen on your great grandparents' farm and before. They are breeds that are have very specific attributes. Most heritage breeds, and certainly I can speak for this for the Tunis here in Georgia, which is hot and humid, um, they're efficient eaters. They have great great turning grass, privet, clover, any type of forage into meat. Like most heritage animals, they are easy. They're good mothers, great maternal instincts. They've not been bred out. They are easy lammers because this breed has not been overbred to have really thick shoulders or things that would inhibit breeding. Um, Nicole mentioned parasite resistance. Here in Georgia, the greatest predator is not coyote. It's not dog. It is the barber pole worm. And that worm can take a healthy sheep down within 48 to 72 hours, particularly if that sheep is a mother who is lactating or at a stage in pregnancy. Heritage, I'm sorry, parasites are a very real issue here. The tunis have a very high parasite resistance. So do the Katahdins that Nicole mentioned, so do Gulf Coast sheep, so do the Barbados. In fact, there's doing a lot of research in the US right now with Barbados to find out why they are so incredibly parasite resistant. The tunas have strong feet, heat and humidity, uh, sheep, hooves and water do not mix. We have 40 something inches of rain here a year. We just had 10 inches in the last two days. So they have good foot rot resistance. And we also literally move the sheep during times like we've had this week where we've had heavy rainstorms, move them to a high spot and keep them away from the low areas as long as we can. Because it is hot here and because it is humid, that's not always a great combination with wool sheep. The belly and the legs of the tunas are almost wool free. That's a cooling attribute. They also have elongated ears. So they are actually like little uh, fans, little air conditioners to keep the tunas cooler. The tunas also have a very interesting American history. 
The first tunis were a gift to our founding fathers from the Bay of Tunisia. Enough tunis were brought over here that they were bred with other breeds until they finally became an established American land race breed. And so they are truly an American breed. Here in the South, in fact, in the mid-Atlantic states, the tunis were the number one sheep in the US on this side of the Mississippi until this little thing called the Civil War happened. And during the Civil War, the tunis literally were almost eaten into extinction. There were some tunis in the Midwest. There were some tunis up around Vermont. There was one large flock that was hidden on the banks of the river near Charleston during the Civil War. They are listed under the watch category with the American livestock breed. And there's been a resounding interest in this breed, not just in the South, but across the US. And so they are slowly building the numbers back up. And that's one of the reasons why, particularly we are so passionate about heritage breeds. There are heritage livestock breeds that are today almost extinct. When they go away, if they go away, we lose tremendous biodiversity. We don't understand the depth of what we're losing. It isn't just a hobby. There's so much science that we have yet to unlock with these heritage breeds. So that's one of the reasons why we chose Tunis for all the other reasons, but also because it is a heritage breed we're passionate about being advocates to a breed that we did not want to see go by the wayside. So we are talking about meat sheep. The tunis has amazing flavor. They're actually listed on the Arc of Taste, the Slow Arc of Taste, which is a repository of specific breeds in the US and actually across the world that are recognized for their flavor. They have a very good size and weight gain. This is my husband. He's preparing um, to do a whole lamb for a party a couple of years ago. He has a background in restaurants. He was a chef before. When we looked at different breeds and we had agreed on going with a heritage breed, one of the reasons why he chose Tunis was because it gained weight quickly enough, not super fast, but it would gain to up to about 100 pounds within eight to 10 months, depending on the forage situation. He liked the size of the chops in terms of selling to other people. He liked the size of the leg, the size of the chops, not too large, not too small. Um, he was satisfied with that. Tunis, like most heritage sheep breeds, has a mild mutton flavor. We just harvested a seven-year-old weather we made most of them into ground lamb, which we love, but we did save his chops just to see how they were. And I will tell you, they were amazingly tasty. We actually have some six months, 16 months of age rather than younger because they like a little bit more full flavor. So in terms of our meat operation, um, we sell our sheep by whole or half carcass. We charge for processing. We don't process ourselves. I so respect Nicole's approach to doing that, but we do not do that. We charge for the sheep and the processing fee. We've looked at USDA to have cuts, but right now it's not worth our while. Um, we may do that in the future. We have a waiting list for meat customers right now. So we're gonna stick with our program. We also have a lamb pickup party uh, when the sheep is ready to be picked up because we retain the pelts or certain parts of the tunis, we can go pick up the sheep. It doesn't always have to be just the customer. And we usually work out a couple of days during the season where people will all join at the farm. They take a tour. We serve them lamb sliders or lamb pate or lamb meatballs. They can try different things and they become part of the farm that day, which is very important to some people. We have families that have come back now for quite a few years on lamb pickup day. We also accommodate sales to someone who just wants to run in and pick it up, but we find that's less of a requested service. Tunis is also a wool sheep. I will just spend a quick few minutes on that. It's got a medium fiber. It's springy, it's strong, it's soft, and can be made into a lot of different um, types of elements. And that's something that I am learning to do myself. So just a nod to that. The other thing I'll say about our farm, um, Tunis is a heritage breed. It's a rare breed. We sell quite a bit of breeding stock and that's where we are focusing on that as well as the meat and the wool. The other thing that we are learning is that people want to come to a farm. I'm continually amazed at how many people want to come for farm visits. They particularly want to come for lamb cuddles. Um, 
We are thinking next spring, I had said I would not do flowers. I would not have guests and events during the spring because it is lambing season and it is busy. But if I were to put on strictly a business hat, I think we're going to do flowers in the hoop house. We're going to have a photographer on board and we're going to do lamb cuddles, get a picture and buy a bouquet of flowers next spring. We do also sell the pelts of the tunis and we've had a number of photographers this year come out one person who does commercial photography is trying to expand his agribusiness portfolio. Another woman who does calendars and cards wants to come out and we're exploring how to utilize the photography. The other thing I want to mention is this past year was a surprise to me. We're on a homestead, we're on a farm. Our life did not change dramatically during COVID. But there were many people around us, particularly in the town of Athens and other areas, where their lives did change. And they wanted to come out to the farm just to walk under the trees, to take a deep breath, to take off their mask and to breathe and to be somewhere else, somewhere safe, somewhere outside. And so that was sobering to us as well as something that we really enjoyed being able to help with. So that is the meat, sheep and more. Ginger uh, mentioned the lambs we had 40 lambs out of 23 moms this year. It was a pretty successful day. Let's get out of this. So. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great, like, tight, packed with full bunch of good information. I really enjoyed that. I, I knew nothing about tuna sheep, and now I'm like, hmm, should that be our next? expansion because we are looking to add protein to our homestead for sure. Um, so I am excited about everything um, that I have learned here tonight. I hope y'all have enjoyed listening to these ladies. They are a wealth of knowledge and um, I'm sure that they would be happy to answer any questions that you have. If you think of something later that comes up, um, I'm sure you can get them on Mighty Network and um, ask them questions as far as whatever you want, uh, if, you, if there's something you need to know. Um, Jesse's been dropping links in the chat, so y'all take a look at those um, if you need to, or if you, if you are interested in anything they had talked about. If you are a VIP, um, we will have um, Nicole's notes which she said she had skipped over some stuff. So all of that information will be in there um, in the VIP section on our website. You log into the account where you can get uh, early access to the videos. All the videos of the National Virtual Gatherings will be up. Um, this will be up by next Wednesday, um, possibly earlier, but I don't promise anything, until, but I will promise it will be up by next Wednesday. Um, and then we'll see, I'm sure Beth will graciously let us also post her um, PowerPoint as well. Uh, so we just really appreciate these ladies. Now, my favorite part of the night, as y'all all know, I love to give away stuff because it's so much fun. Um, so tonight, let me tell you what we got tonight. Tonight for um, all VIPs, all VIPs, whether they're on the uh, gathering or not, um, this was showing up as like a ghost thing earlier because of my green screen. It was like floating through with nothing. Um, we have a Mother Earth News uh, magazine. All of our VIPs are el eligible. Man, that's hard to say when you talk fast. All right, so let's see if I can get the proper wheel of names up here. That is not the proper wheel of names. I'm gonna, oh, I gotta stop doing that because my bar at the top was in the way. So I've got to change that. Okay, here we go. Now, screen share one more time, wheel of names. All of our um, VIP members, whether they are on here tonight or not, good luck, everybody. Who is going to win a sticky note so I can write down their name so that I don't forget? Congratulations, Julie. All right. Jeffco. Awesome. All right. 
So now the giveaway that will not happen tonight, let's get this out of the way, um, is the VIP attendees from tonight. But I'm going to tell you what the giveaway is for them. So this book is so heavy, y'all. It's a big book. This is the complete or gardening complete how to best grow vegetables, flowers, and other outdoor plants. It is, there's a lot of stuff in here and it is just, a. this thing drives me crazy. Okay. It is just a beautiful book. There is beautiful photography <clears throat> and there's lots of good information in here. This is for VIP attendees. Um, again, this is what I will give away at 7.55 um, next month at the beginning of, right before we actually start our gathering. But for everybody that's on here tonight, um, we are giving away, gar oh, look, here's our ghost book. Ooh, Gardening Made Easy. And there's my ring light, you can see. Um, this too, this is a Better Homes and Gardens book. Um, and it too is just a beautiful book. The green screen makes it difficult to show you a gardening book because everything's green and then it just picks up my background and it looks like that. So, okay. So gardening, and then there's my ring light. Gardening Made Easy, Better Homes and Gardens. It's a beautiful book. Let's see out of, and y'all, there's, there aren't a lot of you on tonight, which means you got, really look at that, really great odds and so excited for y'all. Okay, good luck, everybody. Here we go. Let's see who it's going to be. Good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck. And Leslie Scott. Congratulations. I will be sending you an email to, um, to make sure I have your right mailing address so that I can get that to you. All right. Now for the breakout rooms. So again, if you go to a breakout room, you can get the registration link for next month in your breakout room. So if you want to go to a breakout room, I'm getting ready to drop the link in the um, chat. So um, if you want to go to a breakout room, go ahead and go and we will give you the link to um, register for next month. So next month is gonna be a natural disaster preparedness for your home and your community. So this is, um, y'all, we've had some crazy weather in like the last 18 to 24 months. I mean, talking about floods and we've had more tornadoes in my area in the last 18 to 24 months than we have like the rest of my life. And I have lived in this area all my life. It's been insane. Um, so natural disaster, like natural disaster preparedness is big, like not just with this pandemic, but with weather and acts of God and that kind of thing. So we've got great speakers that are going to tell us all about that. So um, you want to get registered for that too. I have just dropped the link in the chat for the breakout rooms. If you want to go to the breakout rooms, go ahead and go. Thank you so much for showing up and attending tonight. Um, I love you all and have so much fun with this every month. Um, thank you for letting me have this job because it brings me so much joy. Um, go ahead and jump to your breakout rooms. They'll give you the link there. If you're not, it is uh, 8.53 right now. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule. That's good. Um, if you are not going to go to the breakout rooms. I'm going to wait till 8.57. And at 8.57, that's in four minutes. No, uh, yes, four minutes. I'm going to put the link for registration um, for next month down there. So if you're not going to the breakout room, just hang out and, um, and I'll drop that in there. Thanks guys so much for um, joining us and we're so excited um, to be able to do this every month and we appreciate everybody. So let us know um, in the comments of the YouTube if you're watching this afterwards, if there's something that you would like to see in future gatherings. Also check us out at nlhc.org and um, you can join us there, find out how to join our organization and we would love to have you join our community. Thanks, see you next month.